Wow. I'll take days like that. I, I, the last Sunday was a little warm, wasn't it? I wasn't here. It's good to see all of you here and trust you're here to worship the Lord. Yeah, we had a little bit different service here today because uh, our schedule wise, but uh, it doesn't change anything because God's always with us at any time. And, you know, somewhere across the other side of the world, if people want to talk to him, I think it'd be available for him. I, I believe that's how that works. It's just amazing to me how that just blows my mind to think that anyone, anywhere can talk to God at the same time and he's able to listen. I got I got uh, a family that whenever there's um, something very important going on, at least they think so, and everybody's talking at once, I can't do it. I, you, somebody's got to be quiet because I can't handle it. <laughs> I wonder, how does the Lord do that? It's pretty amazing. Anyway, I'm not sure how I got off on that. But good to see you all here. Let's start with the word of prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that we can be in your house. And we just praise you for the song that they were playing. That we can have the peace in our hearts that nothing else can take away. That there's no explanation for it. In the midst of all kinds of craziness and chaos, we have that peace. We praise you for that. Give us a good service and we welcome you here. In your name, amen. Grab a hymnal. Let's turn first to number 143, 143. Oh uh -huh. 
something to say about his love maybe that's a decent subject just to talk about Gary speaking of love uh, Lily loves you she does love oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, when I lived in Newville on Route 11 there was a, a guy was building a house he's a builder and he was building he wanted to build a house for all his kids so he built a house for his daughter back behind where I live and I just remembered, he's just such a, really a good Christian man. And I remember just saying, well, you gotta love them to death, love them to death, no matter who the people are. And I knew he was from the Mercersburg area. I didn't think much of that, since maybe he lived somewhere in Mercersburg. Then on my mind, so I thought I'll look him up here. Uh, he lives right down, just keep going well front road here, turns into Clay Lake Road. He lives down that way. So Lily and I were out driving around last night and stopped in. Just so good to catch up with him. And uh, unfortunately, he's got cancer now. But he's just trusting in the Lord for healing. But it's just so good to meet up with somebody that I haven't seen probably in 30 years. But he still has that, you know, he's still that Christian man that he was, still strong in the faith. The love of God is what it's all about. It's pretty neat. Yeah, good inspiration. I mean, he's an inspiration to us. Right. Meet other people like that. It's encouraging. Yeah. Anybody else? Susie, you have something to share with us? Yes, I thank the Lord for Dr. Tom. He said things so good. And I thank the Lord for that. His love for me is kind of marvelous. And for all your prayers. Susie called me, what day was that, Tuesday, Monday? One of those days. Tuesday. She was pretty excited about her news. I kind of was too. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that big answer to prayer. Uh, I saw Diane's hand. Um, I have two praises. I just came to be another great granddaughter. I have a great granddaughter, Macy, just had her baby. Okay. So I'm glad of that. Yep. And also I have a praise. We were going up to my cabin, our cabin, excuse me, and um, my truck sort of acted up. And uh, it was steaming and they were flowing and we didn't know where, so I mean, we were almost up to that canyon. And we didn't know how to get home or anything. Luckily there was a guy, he, he was hosed, Opened up, uh, gave us some water and antifreeze to put in it. And then I took it to Dave Rice's and bring 
castle near our radiator was busted. So I'll clean it, it was able to get us up there and yeah. back. So that was much, you know, praise. And also, uh, think of Claire's son. They were working on the cabin roof. And here's part of the roof is rotten. Yeah. And he fell off the ladder. Oh. And uh, he's okay, he's sore. He fell flat on his back, so he's sore. And also, think of my sister, Nancy. She has COVID, and this is the third week of it. But they can't give her any medicine to help her because she's on Elvis. And they said if they give it to her, she could bleed to death inside. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, she could hardly talk. And, you know, she's just, she's really miserable. Right, let's pray for this. Uh, Monica. Um, just praise the Lord for the time I've been with you at the hospital and mm -hmm. had all the refreshment there and getting me and all the people there and just all around and then seeing God's love. And I have a, an outspoken prayer request for a health issue in the family. And also my niece, Kelly Dukeman, who we've been praying for for a long time, she has bone cancer. Kind of report the fact that she's not good at all. Wow. They're going to try one more round of, I think it's an oral chemo. Uh, uh, that doesn't work. We're going to have to do some surgery, put a port in, and then she's going to have to go to uh, intravenous, which takes the majority of the day, once a week. Uh, so they're going to have to really kick it up this season. Okay. So this is uh, Monica's niece, Kelly, who's not doing well with cancer, so <clears throat> pray for her. Really good to see Tim here today. Somebody else? Well, we want to praise the Lord because we now have our second great-grandchild, uh, a little boy, Mary Ellen, and a uh, little girl who's 19 months old now, and now she has this new little boy, and there were some real risks when that baby was born. They didn't know about until the time of birth. And the Lord spared them any trouble, mother or child, and we're so, so thankful and praise the Lord for that. Great. What's that feel like, Ruth, to be a great-grandmother? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so I, the, way I, the way I understand it, when your parents... You don't spoil your children. When your grandparents, you spoil the children and then send them back with the parents to deal with. And what happens when your great grandparents? Uh, you just go and look at them. <laughs> 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 well, the children don't get hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I went to, we went to see my baby, my, my baby sister's baby, um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, dad informed me that that was number 77, great grandchild on our side of the family. I didn't realize there's that many already. Hard to keep track of them all. Every other day there's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and I did count up the numbers. It's 100 and, uh, 167, I think, I counted in our, on our family. Grandparents down to. It's pretty, pretty big pastel people. And fill up this church. <laughs> Anybody else? Ruth? Yeah, Ruth. Ruby? Yeah. The first song that we sang, You Were My Spent Brian Week. If we've been on a long journey, it's my brother. This earthly journey is complete. If as we share, I share with some of you, if we are rejoicing because we know he's in heaven. I've been witnessing to him over the past years, but it just wasn't the right time. But on last week, when he was in the hospital for the whole week, um, and an hour there on Tuesday evening, August the second, and he did accept the Lord. And then he came home and out on Wednesday when he was back in the ER before I left. I just said that I just need to, you just need to tell me that you, you have Jesus in your heart and 
and facing it through your sins and not yet. So that gives us peace and comfort. I do request prayer for my and family. Yeah. This, they have a very heavy letter. I don't, I'm assuming everybody knows, or for the most part, um, Glenn Dockery, Ruby's brother, who lives down here, passed away. Was that Wednesday night? Thursday. 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 Um, and I did not know until just the other day, that yesterday, that Ruby had led him to the Lord. Wow, that's that's huge. I. Uh, He's been on my heart ever since I moved here. I wanted to see him saved. And the Lord has a way of getting through to people. And I just pray that somehow through this, that Mike and the rest of them will come to know him. So let's pray for the family. It's, but you know, really, I told I was talking to Raymond last night, and I said, Well, it's a whole do for different ball game for a funeral when that when you hear that information. And that's Changes things a lot. So thank the Lord for that. Anybody else? Monica? Ruby saying that reminds, just brings to my mind that they'll never give up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. friends, right. It's friends and loved ones and family that you would try to work with you and you would do more. Yep. Thank you. Sometimes we get, I don't want to use the term bored, but tired of waiting, tired of or tired of asking. I don't know what words to use. We, we, we have a, our attention span isn't as long as it should be on cases like that. Yeah. All done. And join me as we go to prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you are our strength and we are weak. That through you, we have everything we need. Pray to bless us here today. We thank you for the fellowship and the sharing the time we've had and the encouragement we've heard. Just praise you for what you've done for Susie. Continue to help her. Give her strength. And we just can't thank you enough for that good report. We praise you in ways that we can't even put into words that you got through to Glenn before it was too late. And we praise you that Ruby was persistent and we gave her the, the, the wisdom and the courage to keep pressing. And we just praise you, Lord, that he's with you now. Be with the family, would you keep them near you? And somehow through this, would you help them to, to know your love as well? Thank you that Tim can be here today. Continue to strengthen and encourage him. Would you be with Jack here today? Give him a touch of your blessing. Be with Claire's son as he's had this small accent. Would you help him to mend? Uh, be with Nancy. She has physical trouble and um, pray you'll be with her in a special way. Be with Monica's request that the unspoken that's on her heart. And I know there's others that we have situations that we can't really talk about. I know myself, I have a number of things of, of that nature, and I think all of us do. And I pray to be with those here this morning. Be with her niece, Kelly, as she's not doing well. Help her feel your presence and, and our love around her. Be with Denny. Continue to give him strength. Give him healing and just work a miracle in his life. Be with Deb in a special way. Lord, we thank you and praise you for our church. We thank you for what you do for us and what you mean for us. And I pray you help us to hear from you today. Guide us in your name. Amen. A handful of announcements. Of course, there's no service this evening. And then next Sunday, I just want to make sure I have my calendar right. But yes, that's what I'm planning. Yes. Next Sunday night, the 21st, we're going to have focus groups in the gym because we're leaving on vacation, we'll be gone over the 28th. 
So um, we'll plan next Sunday to have our, our focus group in the gym. And Sunday school board meeting this third Tuesday night at 6.30. And then just remember, um, some of you probably have the funeral details, but if not, <clears throat> the viewing for Glenn will be here Friday night from 6 to 8. Make sure I'm getting this right, Ruby. 6 to 8 Friday night, right? Yes. Here. And then the funeral, we'll start with the viewing on, sat on Saturday morning at 10, and the funeral will be at 11. And everything's here at the church, and then there'll be a meal afterwards. So I think that's um, clear enough. And just keep them in your prayers this week. Any announcements I've missed? All right, we'll sing another song. Let's turn together to number 470. 470. You know how you depend, well, some of you, but in today's culture, technology, we depend on GPS, depend on our phones now to get us where we're going a lot. And, you know, different times I had to think, you know, wandering around and, oh, we're okay, well, let's, I'll find myself real quick. I had to think, you know, a few years back that we couldn't really do it that easily. And I was thinking up here, we would be lost, many people would be lost without their phone. But they ever stop and think about how lost they are without Jesus? I don't know what I'd do without him. I really don't. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. I'll also ask you, when you find that, to turn to Philippians 4, 8, and just put a marker in that, and we'll look at that later. <clears throat> marker in Philippians 4, 8, 
and 1 Peter chapter 1. How many of you have um, ever attended an air show? Some of you? Several years back, we had um, the opportunity to attend an air show near Virginia Beach at the Naval Station there. And uh, got there for about two hours of it. You, we were able to see like the Tomcat performing and the Blue Angels, and it's really awesome. If you haven't seen the Blue Angels before, that's pretty cool. Um, but when a pilot is flying a jet, especially a fighter jet, and they make a slight adjustment, you experience a G-force. Depending on how strong that adjustment is, depends on how strong the G-force is. Up, down, sideways, whatever. And standing there at that air show, when those pilots would make adjustments, I could feel it in my chest. It was that loud. It was like they would turn, you could feel it. And I didn't have earplugs. So just an, uh, a note of information, if you ever go, take your books. Um, but I, you know, you feel like, man, that's, that's powerful. Imagine what the pilot's feeling at that point. I've never experienced G-forces. The strongest G-force I've experienced was like when we're going down Cool Hollow Road and you go over all those miles. <laughs> <laughs> and what's even more cool is you put the boys in the back of the truck and just hit them bumps. <laughs> Hopefully you lose one of them along the way. But <laughs> uh, they would probably enjoy that, actually. But I'd recommend an empty stomach if you're going to do it. I wouldn't mind trying a fighter jet to see what that feels like, I, I think. I think I wouldn't mind trying it. But um, again, probably on an empty stomach. <laughs> So you're wondering probably, what in the world are you talking about G-forces for? Well, it's a little corny, but uh, we're going to talk about three Gs today. And Peter shares three Gs that every Christian should experience and should practice, and we're going to talk about those. So looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 13, we're going to read through 16. And keep that section open because we're going to be referring to that. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And being focused and disciplined is a must for any Christian. You look at Peter for a minute, you think about all the life lessons he had to learn. Wouldn't it have been cool to live with Peter and just watch how he changed? <laughs> Imagine that. Think about the lessons he had to learn before he could admonish Christians on this subject. I mean, he had no room to talk at one point. But then at one point, God had changed him so big that he was able to admonish other Christians. And that's pretty crazy. He was a piece of work. He was rude and rough, and he opened his big mouth way too often, and and he jumped before he looked, and he shot before he aimed, and all those things. I have a son that does that. And once he even denied he knew Jesus. Well, three times, actually. And God obviously did something crazy in Peter's life because... When we think of Peter now, we think of a powerhouse of faith, one that helped establish the church as we know it. It's pretty crazy, and, and I think everyone knows that he was crucified upside down because I will not be crucified the same as my Lord. Quite a change from the bumbling, rough, rude, crude fisherman. But he wrote some very wise admonition here in this first chapter, and I want to look at three G's that Peter shared. And the first one is gird. Look at verse 13. Gird up the loins of your mind. In those days, men wore these long flowing robes, which swung around the ankles. 
And if they were to run, engage in battle, work, pretty much any activity which involved more than just walking, they had to tie their robes up a little higher and bundle them so they didn't get in their way. Imagine how embarrassing that would have been for one of those guys, tough guys, to be fighting someone maybe in a war and they trip over their own skirt, so to speak, um, their own robe, and fall flat on their face. I mean, that just wouldn't go. just wouldn't work. Um, and I'm not sure why they did it. I mean, I guess they didn't know how to make trousers back then, but that's how they did it. Um, however, even today, some of these guys have trouble with their trousers and they need to gird those a little tighter too. Um, <laughs> and maybe they need to read this scripture. But here Peter's using this common analogy of that day to illustrate the importance of keeping a tight rein on our minds remaining focused and determined to please God. First Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 10:5 says casting down imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. There is a statement a, a quote and I read it to you it says watch your thoughts they become words. Watch your words they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. We need to make sure our thoughts are pleasing to God. And we literally need to take our thought life captive, control it, and make sure we aren't dwelling on impure things. And I've stated before, but nothing happens unless it first enters the mind. You want to kick the cat, if that's something you feel like you need to do, you have to have it enter your mind. Any simple movement has to be in the head before it takes place. No, Susie, you won't come kick your cat. Um, <clears throat> your mind has to process that before it happens. So before you do something that isn't pleasing to God, you need to first be thinking about it. And we need to try to stop those thoughts before they become actions. Our text tells us to restrain our minds. Just as a man during that time had to do something about his flowing robes because he was going to do something strenuous and he didn't want to be tripped up by them, so we as Christians can't allow our loose thoughts to trip us up spiritually. Look at that, the passage, Philippians 4, and I, and I know everyone knows the passage, I mean, for the most part, but I just want you to be looking at it so we can just quickly go through that. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there is any virtue or any praise, think on these things. And that's a great verse to tie into watching what you think about. And I want to just real quickly run down through the list of each one of these traits. The word true, it is consistent with facts or reality. It's not false or erroneous. It's not counterfeit. It's real. It's genuine. <clears throat> you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth is a very touchy word for me these days. I am not happy how truth is used so flippantly. Anything that doesn't line up with the truth of God's word is false. What God says is true. It always will be. And we don't want to be thinking or dwelling on things that are counterfeit that Satan has to offer. And there is so much false information thrown about everywhere today that we can dwell on. We need to think on what is true. Then the word honest. That's not deceptive or fraudulent. It's not false or misleading. It's genuine. We need to fill our mind with honest things. All around us, people are bent on deception, deceiving others, taking advantage of others. Let's purpose in our minds that we'll be honest. What a different place. Can you imagine what this world would be like if everyone was completely honest? We need to develop an honest mindset. Then the word just, that's honorable and fair in one's dealings and actions. It's consistent 
with what's morally right. Are we thinking about doing things that are honorable? Are we desiring to be fair? Are we do things that are morally right in our lifestyles, our actions? Do we treat people properly? Are we thinking about those things? And the word pure. It's free of dirt, pollutants, infectious agents, or other unwanted elements. Is our mind filled with the dirt that Satan brings? Most of you know by now, I don't like dirt. Um, I was raised in a home that was very clean, and I don't like dirt. But isn't it amazing that we sometimes get more concerned with the dirt that is visible rather than the dirt that can fill our minds? I spent, um, Gabe and Janet Norris were at our youth camp this past weekend. They, they, that's, they come to our camp. And um, I told him about the rock that hit our windshield, my truck windshield, on the, was it Monday or Tuesday, and exploded glass into the truck. And he laughed. He goes, oh, man, I know what you were doing. He said, picking up every little piece of glass. And he was making fun of me. <laughs> I didn't appreciate it. <laughs> but he was right, dude. I see the word pollutants, and I think of a chemical spill that happened a number of years ago near Hanover, um, where I grew up. And it was a warehouse that housed chemicals, I think like pesticides and whatnot. And it, 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 um, there was somehow a spill, and it leaked into the Conewago Creek, which is a very large creek center similar to the Conewago and all downstream, fish died and it was polluted for a long way. People couldn't swim in it. And I think about those pollutants that we allow in our minds, what many people allow in their minds. That's much worse, much more deadly. And these pollutants infect us and not affect, but infect. The enemy wants us to become trapped with those pollutants. And they can so corrupt our thoughts and our minds that eventually, and it really doesn't take that long, our actions and our deeds become dirty and polluted. Then the word lovely, that's something that's very beautiful or attractive. It's, the commentary definition is, is it's, um, it's amiable or agreeable in nature. Are we thinking about ways to get along with other people? Are we stewing over things and trying to figure out ways to set other people straight? Are we thinking about ways to act attractively? And whenever I say acting attractively, I immediately think of Gomer Pyle. I don't know how many of you have watched Gomer Pyle? Um, some of you, the older ones. I love Gomer Pyle, not because I'm older, but um, I love Gomer Pyle. Um, <laughs> And I remember this one episode where there was a guy in his platoon that came in for a little bit, and he was being really nasty. He was nasty to everybody, really being nasty to Goomer. And they were telling him, Goomer, set him straight. Knock his lights out. Take him out. <laughs> and so he invited him to step outside. And they thought, oh, this is going to take place. And they all stood around the windows and watched. And Goomer stood there and says, I don't believe you're behaving very attractively. And he said, now I'm glad we had this talk. And every time I think of behaving attractively, I think of that. Are we thinking on ways to better our relationship with others? Or are we just thinking negatively and bad about other people all the time? Because that tends to be what humans do. Let's not do that. And then good report. Commentaries say that this means it's something that is beneficial. Well, that's a loaded statement. Are we thinking about things that are beneficial? Beneficial to others? Would what we're thinking about, if it was acted upon, would it benefit anyone? <laughs> Man. Similar to the statement that if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. If what we're thinking about, if we do it, if it doesn't benefit anyone, then maybe we shouldn't be thinking about it. Yeah, that is, 
Wow, that's tough. That's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow. But then it says, if there's any virtue in praise, if what you're thinking on is virtuous, if it's worthy of praise, then you go ahead and think about it. That's what you'd be thinking about. And that subject, and whenever I go over that, I think about my own thought life and I ponder, it's like, wow, we spend a lot of time thinking about things. And I catch myself every once in a while. That's not helping you any. Change your thoughts. Do some, think about something else. So to recap this point, we need to gird up, we need to, to rein in, we need to, to restrain our thoughts so they are pleasing to God. Because sin starts in the mind. And then the third, second G is we need to guard. Look at verse 14 of our text in, in uh, 1 Peter. <clears throat> As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves, according to the former lusts in your ignorance. So we need to guard our minds, but we also need to guard our hearts. We need to be careful to guard our hearts against former lusts or habits or lifestyles. We don't usually use the term lusts anymore, but it's, it's desires, it's things that aren't pleasing to God. Those things only distract us from serving Him, but also potentially destroy a relationship with God. You can tell what kind of work a person is in by how they dress, typically. I mean, not all the time, but often. Uh, let's say, you know, a mechanic uses a uniform of, of some sort and it probably has a name on it and they're often maybe greasy. A butcher wears a long white apron that has blood splatters on it. Uh, maybe a nurse wears scrubs. A lawyer maybe wears a suit. Uh, you know, they fashion themselves according to their occupation. And so it is with people. You can tell what's in a person's heart by the lifestyle they live. The pity is that many people that want to be Christians are still wanting to have some of those lifestyles and habits that they participated in before they got saved. And that's not guarding your heart. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't expect to have a heart that is pure and dedicated to God while all at the same time looking back and wanting to do those things that you knew weren't pleasing to God in the first place. Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Conform means that you go along with or agree with something. Being transformed means a radical change. Becoming a child of God means a radical transformation. We can't expect to continue to give in to Satan and practice sinning while we're serving God. It just doesn't work. What appears to be a harmless glance can turn romance, can turn to romance and homes are divided. Feelings that should never have been awakened within, tearing the heart in two. Listen, I beg of you. For a soul that remains sincere with conscience clear, guard your heart. The human heart is easily swayed and often betrayed at the hand of emotion. You dare not leave the outcome to chance. You must choose in advance or live with the agony. Such needless tragedy. Guard your heart. Don't trade it for treasure. Don't give it away. Guard your heart. As a payment for pleasure, it's a high price to pay. Transformed means changed. Guard your heart and don't look back. Don't desire those things that will tear you away from God. And eternity spent with him. And then the third G is guide. We need to ask God to guide our lifestyle. Verse 15 and 16 are in text there in 1 Peter. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And this word conversation in the original Greek means a, just a pattern of lifestyle, behavior. What's the simplest way of putting this? Act like you're a Christian. In everything you do, make sure you're pleasing God. But when you look at the next verse, you say, be holy like God? Hmm, I don't know that I can do that. Another verse says along the same lines, be perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And many people get hung up over this because, well, we cannot be God. And we shouldn't even try. And the misunderstanding is on this word perfect. 
It's referring to a perfection of our desires. What is our desire? Do we desire to please God? Then that's a perfect desire. We must be willing to do what he wants us to do and please him. We're serving a holy God that cannot be in the same place as sin. So how can God dwell in our hearts if there is sin there? So we need to create a holy place for the Lord to dwell. We need to ask him to direct our lives, to guide us through the Holy Spirit, and show us things that he's not pleased with. And we could go further into, into this topic about lifestyles and what is pleasing and what isn't pleasing to God, but I think you can figure it out. I mean, everyone should know what pleases God and what doesn't. But what is necessary to remember, that is, if you have decided, I'm going to gird my mind, guide my heart, then you need to ask God to guide my life. And he'll make sure you're guided in the way you want to go, or he wants you to go. He is, we need to listen. You know, sometimes we talk about <clears throat> um, praying and not sure exactly if our prayer is something God wants us to have. You know, sometimes God knows better than, you know, maybe we shouldn't have that thing or this thing. Well, if we're praying the prayer here, you know, Lord, help me to gird my mind and guard my heart and then please guide my life. Oh, he'll answer that prayer for sure. As I stated before, a G-force is something that causes us to feel funny if we're making a drastic change in direction. And these three G's that Peter admonished Christians to practice um, really can't happen until there's a drastic change in direction. And just stop and ask yourselves, and I know this is somewhat elementary, but have I made that drastic change of direction in my life? Am I following Christ? No, no one can be forced to follow God. You have to want to do it. There are people that I've worked with over what I consider my relatively short life. It seems to be getting longer every day. I'm not sure how to stop that. Um, but I've worked with people that you just can't change. You can't make them do what you want them to do. That's for whatever reason, it doesn't work. Be sure nice if you can, would you please do this? I know it's right for you. But making a drastic change in direction causes a pilot or driver to experience some pressure. And it could be severe depending on how, how hard it is. And when you make that drastic change in direction in your life, you're gonna experience pressure from old friends, Maybe they want you to participate in something you used to do that you knew is pleasing God. Maybe you'll experience pressure from old habits that crop up and, and hard to die off. Maybe addictions. And, and Satan's going to give you pressure. Make no mistake about that. He doesn't like transformations. He'll attack you more than ever when he sees a change. And he'll, he'll want you to get you to come back. And he'll do whatever he can to ha make that happen. I heard a story one time as a friend of mine. I, honestly, it's been a while, so I can't even remember who was telling me the story. I just, I just remember this guy saying that he was talking to a friend of his who was really struggling and saying he wanted to do what God wanted him to do, but it was like every day he was struggling because Satan was fighting him and he didn't want to do. And this man told him, he said, well, you're going to struggle every single day because Satan's going to fight. If you're serving God, you're going to struggle. And that man says, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I don't want to struggle. So he just quit. Wow, that is so sad. Just gave up. And eventually that man died without knowing Christ. I'll never say that being a Christian is easy. In fact, some days not being a Christian seems a whole lot more attractive because you don't have to deal with, with Satan fighting but I'd much rather have Satan fight me and know that Jesus is on my side. And sometimes we have to make those hard decisions so there's drastic changes that exert pressure from the enemy, but it's so worth it in the long run. There awaits this victor's crown in this mansion. I'd like to see what that's like if we remain faithful. I think of the chorus, I'm going through, I'm going through. I'll pay the price, whatever others do. I'll take the way with the Lord's despised few. I'm going through with Jesus. I'm going through. So I hope that's your desire. I know the title was a little bit corny, and I know the illustrations maybe, but I hope that helped drive the point home that uh, 
We need to ask God to gird our minds and guard our hearts and to guide us in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for who you are and what you do for us and how through your word we can know and learn to live more like you. And I pray you help each one of us to determine to make whatever drastic change in our lives are needed to point us towards you in the best possible way that we can gird our minds and think on things that are pleasing to you and that you'll help us to guard our hearts, that we won't go back to those things that aren't pleasing to you and then to <clears throat> guide us in our lives, that whatever we do will please you and that we would draw others to you as well. Be with everyone today. Would you give safety traveling? Would you just give them all a blessed day in you, in your name? Thank you so much for coming. You are dismissed.